you're looking at a picture of the Holy Trinity Church at Stratford-upon-Avon. And I want to draw to your attention specifically this area just here to the left. Um, if I move into it there, you can see what I'm talking about. You might notice that the bars on the, on the first two windows to the left there looks very different from the bars to the window of the right, and so does the stonework. The thing is that there used to be, this is an old picture from um, 1799, 1800, you'll see that there was a great big building stuck in a rather unattractive way onto the side of it, pushing into the end window. This was known as the Bone House, or the Charnel House, and it had various functions. One of the things is it held an awful lot of uh, bones of the dead. If I go back to the outside of this section, um, you will see here quite a neat line of bricks where the bricks are different on one side from the other. Um, and I've said about those bars. So it's kind of obvious that this whole section here is actually newer. It must have been put in after about 1800 when the charnel house was knocked down. What's interesting about this, it means this whole section was actually taken out and just behind the window here is where we have the famous monument to William Shakespeare. If we go to the inside there, we can see the monument as it sits against that window. So at some point it was it was taken down when the whole wall was taken down. Um, now, here's a picture um, going back to the, I think, mid-ish or um, early to mid-19th century. There you can see the Shakespeare monument, all painted all white in those days. And there's the blocked up door through to the charnel house. And, and one of the things you'll notice also is behind the Shakespeare monument, it's blocked in. You don't get the stained glass windows that are there today. So we're going to have a look at this extraordinary thing. It's not hugely attractive. It's very over, over repaired, over decorated, over restored. And there's been quite a lot of complaints, particularly amongst people who really love Shakespeare's works. I think why this very unattractive, thick, dull looking fellow here. The statue dates from around about 1650. Um, we can tell that from this moustache, which only came into fashion particularly that gap actually between the moustache and the bottom of his nose. That came into fashion around 1650. I, I think the statue is about 1650, but there are some who think it was even later than that, about 100 years after that. But certainly it's not um, it's not original and uh, original to the monument. And there you can see a paper and a quill. If we go back to some of the earlier images of it, there, there you can see that actually he doesn't have a paper and quill at all. He's holding a, a sack. Actually, it's specifically a, 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 a wool pack um, tied, at, tied at all four corners. So this is telling us that the guy here, uh, William Shakespeare of Stratford, William of Stratford, is, is a wool dealer. Um, and a couple of interesting aspects about this. He, you can see at the top he's um, got himself a coat of arms. He's rather gone up in the world for a wool dealer. Um, have a look at... This little fellow, a little cherub, he's holding an hourglass and therefore he represents time. He symbolises time and he's looking in a, in a slightly you get on with it sort of way over his shoulder at his brother here, another little cherub, who's holding a spade and he represents truth. The idea is that truth was buried at the, in the centre of the earth and time uh, would extract truth. So no, no matter how many lies and bullshit is spoken, uh, in the end time will, will fish it out. Here's a, a sort of quite conventional image of this. You see Father, Father Time with his um, sickle and his wings and he's pulling his daughter, Truth, um, out of the pit in the earth, it looks a bit like a, a well, and there's a rascal holding onto her foot, hoping that truth won't escape, and another rascal you can see fleeing the scene uh, in shame. Um, obviously, uh, truth is going to reveal a lot of muck about him that he's rather hoping would never come out. Um, so that's what those two little two little cherubs are symbolising, and one might ask, well, well, what truth is going to re be revealed? when we dig in the centre of the earth, that is concerning uh, Shakespeare, the Shakespeare Monument, Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, have a look a bit more closely 
at uh, this uh, uh, this this drawing of it. This is done by Wenceslas Holler, very brilliant, very accurate, and much um, lauded uh, person of his day. And it was first published in 1656. Notice, I think this is interesting, the 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 sockets, the joints there on his shoulders and the sloping shoulders. Very um, weird, in fact, you would say not particularly um, like a human being. I'll show you another drawing of the monument from the 17th century. This one, I think, much earlier by um, a fellow called William Dugdale, who was a heraldic artist, so he knew um, a lot about a lot of things and particularly interested in the symbolism of things. Um, dating from about 1634, have a look at the very strange sloping shoulder, very long arm, and what looks like a sort of claw down there, more of a claw than actually a hand. Um, this figure is measurably more monkey-like than human. I want you to look very closely at the two capitals. Remember, capital comes from the Latin word caput, meaning head. Um, look between them and, and, and look carefully, and you'll see that they're drawn. They, they look like just normal Corinthian capitals, but they're actually drawn in precisely the same way, each one. They have a sort of front leaf with a little mark on, on it, and then two curling bits at the top and two further curling bits. Um, if I were to put one of these caputs, one of these heads, Directly on top of this figure, you might understand what I'm what I'm getting at. There, you can see what looks very evidently like a, an organ grinder's monkey. In fact, if I were to put that one back and put the other one on, um, yeah, exactly the same thing. Notice I didn't actually rescale those to do it. So, what is going on here? Um, this, I think, is 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 how the capitals originally looked, and of course, everything's been replaced. This is a, a mock-up of, of of the original capitals, as I believe they were, based on that drawing. So, so you can see how it's been done in a sort of three D, with that leaf at the front, mouth, eyes, ears, um, and there, actually, there's a there, there's a long history of turning Corinthian capitals into faces. It goes right back to Roman times. There's also quite a long history of, of making these sort of weird little jokes um, on epitaphs in churches and such like, um, actually also in the Stratford church. So um, let's put that to the side and, and ask what it's about. Now, th th there's quite a bit of evidence that this monument may have been designed and the epitaph written by Ben Jonson, the famous poet who seems to have had his hand in the making of the first folio in 1623 uh, and in the prefatory material to the first folio. And it's thought also that he had, had a hand in designing the uh, Fenchurch Street Arch in 1603, and he was quite bossy with Indigo Jones about uh, theatre designs. He had certainly had an eye, and I I think there's some good reason to suppose that he actually designed this. So what is he designing it to make us all feel that Shakespeare's a monkey about? Well, he published a book that he was immensely proud of, of his complete works, only a few years earlier, in 1616. And in that book, he has a poem called On Poet Ape. Now, Poet ape does not mean a poet, actually. It means an actor, someone who apes or imitates a poet. So in those days, the poet would read out his poems to the actor and the actor would imitate it back, often not really understanding what it was all about. But uh, they, So they became known, slightly contemptuously actors, as poet apes. Um, so we know that William of Stratford was, was, was an actor, poet ape. So let's have a, a little look at this poem. It's not very long. Um, and there are many scholars and since the 19th century who say that this poem is actually about William um, of Stratford, William Shakespeare of Stratford. Poor poet ape, that would be thought our chief. Now, why would William of Stratford be thought our chief? Who is our chief? Uh, ben Jonson is a, is a poet and a playwright. I think the most obvious answer to who his chief was, the chief of all the poets and playwrights, uh, was Edward de Vere, who was the Earl of Oxford. Um, he held the lease on the, on, on the first public theatre. Um, he ran his own company of players. Uh, three of his servants, Evans, Hunnis and Lily, were running three of the court's most important um, play troops. 
and he was a great patron to the playwrights, um, most notably to Anthony Mundy, John Lilly, uh, Watson, Nash, Green, etc. So he's the chief. So so here we have William of Shakespeare, who'd like it to be thought that he's our chief. Hmm, he'd like it to be thought that he's Edward de Vere of Earl of Oxford. Um, obviously, because his name, um, William Shakespeare, is pretty similar to William Shakespeare, um, whose works are in the frippery of wit, um, from brokage, is become so bold a thief. He's a, so he's a broker, this guy. And you can see the picture as he holds a, a wool pack. He's a merchant. and But now he's become so bold a thief as we the robbed leave rage and pity it. At first he makes low shifts, a very monkey-like image, would pick and glean by the reversion to old plays, of old plays. That's very interesting. Uh, William of, Sh uh, of Stratford is buying up old plays. What, in, what Do we have any evidence for this? Here's two old plays, The London Prodigal and The Yorkshire Tragedy, written in, uh, published in 1605 and 1608, respectively. That's just a few years after the death of the Earl of Oxford. And it says on one by William Shakespeare, and on the other written by W. Shakespeare. Well, I don't think there's anyone who believes that these plays are by William Shakespeare. Um, some people say, oh, I'll tell you what, the, the cheating publisher just put William Shakespeare on it because that was a name that sold copies. Don't think you can get away with that, really, because just above, as it was played by the King's Majesty's Servants. Well, we know that uh, William of Stratford was involved with the King's Majesty's Servants in a business capacity and possibly in an acting capacity. Um, and on this side, acted by His Majesty's Players at the Globe. So clearly, if William Shakespeare of Stratford were writing these plays, uh, uh, they're not by him, and there would have been a massive complaint that we would have heard about. So what I think we're seeing here is what Ben Jonson says, is that he's bought up the reversion of old plays, and he's stuffed his name on them. Uh, he probably wants people to think they're by him. So go back to the poem, by the reversion of old plays, now grown to a little wealth and credit on the scene. Yes, well, we can see on the right there, he's got himself a, a coat of arms. He's pushing his way up in this uh, society. He takes up all, makes each man's wit his old own, and told of this, he slights it. Tut such crimes the sluggish gaping auditor devours. That's a wonderful phrase, the, the sluggish gaping auditor. That's the, the, the sort of idiot who, who believes that uh, Stratford of Shakespeare, who's, who's merely dealing in plays, is actually the author. And nowadays we're, we're, we're much politer, and, and we call these people Stratfordians. But um, nonetheless, sluggish gaping auditor is, is rather a more amusing way of describing them. The sluggish gaping auditor uh, takes this up. He marks not whose twas first, and after times may judge it to be his as well as ours. After times is posterity, future generations um, may suppose that these plays, with William Shakespeare's name on the front, are actually written by him and are as good as ours, says Ben Jonson. Fool, as if half eyes will not know a fleece from locks of wool or shreds from the whole piece. So he's uh, the, the, the punch of an epigram always comes in the last two lines, the last cup couplet that's where the salt is and here he's saying he'll you could always know a fleece from locks of wool he's saying he's just a basically a wool merchant and we can see that and that he uh, a fleece has a double meaning to fleece is to to con to rip off so even half eyes even with our eyes half shut we know a fleece actually it's very specifically a fleece is is to steal someone else's clothes so this uh, William of Stratford is, is, is disguising himself in someone else's clothes. Fool as if half eyes will not know a fleece from locks of wool or shreds from the whole piece. Um, so that tells us a bit about the top half. And now let's now let's look at the epitaph, which is at the bottom. And all things are connected and it's been a great waste of time really that we've gone for so long without anyone bothering to ask how is this epitaph connected to the bit on the top of it the the, the, the monkey and the and the search for truth and and how are the two latin lines at the top there connected to the english lines because they are connected and you anyone who's studied renaissance art will know that interconnection is one of the key parts of it all let's start with the English bit, stay passenger, read if thou canst, 
two commandments. Um, this, I think, is very interesting because, again, it brings us back to Ben Johnson. Uh, there was a man who served as captain in the Earl of Oxford's regiment, and his name was Henry de la Ware. And Ben Johnson wrote when he died, If, passenger, thou canst but read, stay. And look on the monument, stay, passenger, read if thou canst. If, passenger, thou canst but read, stay. So I think we've got some pretty good evidence here that this epitaph is written by Ben Johnson, just as I think the, the whole monument is designed by Johnson to impart various messages. Okay. Read if thou canst whom envious death hath placed within this monument. This gap has been much remarked upon. Some people think it's a misprint, but it's not. Now, some of my, some of you looking at this will say, oh dear, he's going back over old ground. I, I'm sorry I am. I've given a, a slightly briefer version of this in a presentation um, called Where is Shakespeare Really Buried? And that just comes at the beginning of it. But I'm just going to go over it again and give a tiny bit more detail and then we'll move on within this monument. So that gap is actually suggesting you put a bracket on it. Take that out. In this monument, what have we got left? Read if thou canst, whom envious death hath placed with Shakespeare. In this monument, work out if you can who Shakespeare is buried with. That's the hidden riddle. So if I re reassemble it, cleverly I hope, so that we maintain a rhyming pattern and we re maintain uh, ten syllables per line, we now have stay passenger why ghost thou by so fast, read in this monument if thou canst, whom envious death with shaker spear hath placed. So, um, I don't know what to say next. There's, yeah, there's, so there's your, your rhyming scan, A, B, A, B, C, C, um, which makes it very clear. And we're being asked by this riddle, with whom is Shakespeare buried? So the obvious place to look is in the Latin couplet at the top. And I say it's obvious because there you have the words terra tegit, earth covers. So obviously if we're going to find who he's buried with, we're going to look who it covers. If you know your Latin, then you know you go from the subject of the sentence to find the object, i.e. in the accusative tense, the earth covers what or whom. Here we go. It covers Pilius uh, with his judgment. Eudicio Pilio. He was a, a, a Greek king, Nestor, famous for his judgment. Um, it covers Socrates with his genius, Genio Socratum, the philosopher, not a writer, he was a philosopher. Um, and it covers Maro, Virgilius Maro. We know him better now as Virgil, but also known as Maro in his day. Virgilius Maro with his art. Um, the last two phrases there, populus meret, that means people mourn, and Olympus habet which means Olympus holds. So there's your translation. Earth covers, people mourn, Olympus holds, Pilius with his judgment, Socrates with his genius, and Maro with his art. Well, don't forget we're looking for where Shakespeare, who Shakespeare's buried with, and it's pretty obvious that he's not buried with Maro, Socrates, and Pilius because they are all uh, people from ancient classical uh, history and we have no idea where any of them are buried. So clearly there are allusions to other people, people who Shakespeare might be buried uh, with. Uh, there's a little clue, I think, here. Olympus Harbert, Olympus Holds. Um, Olympus was the mountain where the court of the gods in the ancient Greeks was he held. Um, uh, in, in, in London, obviously, the court was in London, and the traditional court of the monarch in London was at Westminster. And some of you will know that Queen Elizabeth was called Astrea, Astrea the goddess who lived at Olympus. Um, and so Olympus is perhaps a clue to Westminster. Okay, um, Arte Maronem. This is an allusion to someone who Shakespeare might be buried with. Who is it? Actually, I choose this one first because it's it's the easiest. I don't think there would be a single literary learned person in the age of William Shakespeare who wouldn't know that the English Marrow, the Marrow of his age, uh, he was known as the Virgil of England, 
my Virgil, who's called in 1595, imitator of Virgil. Virgil's heir apparent, as well as his contemporaries were calling him, our modern Marrow, our English Virgil. And he was, of course, Edmund Spencer. Edmund Spencer is buried in Westminster Abbey in what we call Poet's Corner, right there. Um, so who's this next to him? Uh, who's supposed to be like Socrates with his genius? Who's this an allusion to? Well, it's an allusion to the poet who was addressed in his lifetime, O oh, Socrates, in 1385, known as the noble philosophical poet who had the heavenly mind of prudent Socrates. Socrates Ingenium was written on his tomb. He had the genius of Socrates, Genio Socratem, and he was Geoffrey Chaucer, and he is buried alongside Spencer right there. So Eudicio Pilium um, should be someone who's buried alongside that and indeed um, means judicious Pilius. Pilius famed for his judgment and indeed there is someone um, uh, who is buried right there. He also is a poet, actually a playwright, and um, he was known for his judgment and called judicious by a whole range of contemporaries, including Anton Pestel, Mosley, Cartwright, Cocaine, Fuller, Dryden and Langbane, all knew him as Judicious Beaumont. Great help and advisor, he advised Ben Jonson in his plays, and people went to him and asked for his judgment. So we can see quite clearly then uh, that we have three allusions to three uh, poets, Francis Beaumont, Geoffrey Chaucer and Edmund Spencer, who are buried in precisely that lineup in Westminster Abbey. So we've answered the riddle uh, who has envious death placed with Shakespeare, and we know that Shakespeare is buried now somewhere in Westminster Abbey. Um, this creates uh, quite a, a no small amount of confusion. Um, if Shakespeare's buried in Westminster Abbey, what on earth is the point of hiding all this in, in a hidden riddle and a hidden, hidden answer with illusions? Um, I think it's time we started to split this epitaph into two parts. I think the, the part on the left um, represents a, a, a commemoration in honour of the author of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark and all those plays, known as William Shake hyphen Spear, William Shakespeare the writer. But I think the epitaph can also be read uh, in commemoration of our merchant, our poet ape, William of Stratford. So how does this work and what problems are we going to face? First of all, uh, notice that when I turn the verse on the left, uh, to ensure that it rhymed and it had ten syllables, I had to add a syllable, shake a spear, to make it up to ten. Um, and the original monument has shack spear. So that quite conveniently helps us to separate. We've got the playwright on the left and the wool dealer and actor on the right. Now, notice at the top we've got these Latin lines, Eudicio Pilium. Well, I've just gone through all those and I've just shown you that they're saying where he's secretly buried. And clearly this cannot apply to William of Stratford because we have a record of his being buried at Stratford. And we know now that this is a hidden allusion to where someone's buried. And there's no reason on earth to hide that allusion. If it's for William of Stratford, you'd just have a plaque saying, our townsman William of Stratford is, is buried in Westminster Abbey, um, but we commemorate him here. We need the secrecy. So I think we can be fairly sure that just these two Latin lines do not apply to William of Stratford. So I'm going to delete them. Oh, I hear you say, just delete them. That's a bit cavalier. Um, you ought to do something on the other side if you're going to do that. All right, then I will. Actually, there's two Latin lines down here. Obit Anni Domino 1616. That applies to William of Stratford. Um, died in his 53rd year. Uh, DA 23rd on the 23rd of April. It applies to William of Stratford and it certainly doesn't seem to apply to the author of Shakespeare. Um, Shake hyphen Spear. At least it would be extremely unlikely if his death date was exactly the same date as William Stratford. So I'm going to delete those two Latin lines and on uh, William of Stratford's we'll put it up at the top. So now we've got a perfect balance 
um, two Latin lines at the top of each and six English lines. OK, let's start with William of Stratford's um, epitaph and see how that reads. Stay, passenger, why ghost thou by so fast? Read if thou canst. Um, I think that's possibly being a little bit rude. We don't know that William of, of, of Stratford could read. Um, it looks like he probably couldn't write because his um, signature is, is a bit dodgy. He certainly was unlettered, but I think to assume that all of his friends wouldn't be able to read is, is Ben Johnson being a, a, a little bit rude, but never mind. Read if thou canst, whom envious death hath placed within this monument. Okay, so we know, we're, we know we're not going back to that riddle. I've closed up the within to make it one word. So what does that mean? Well, we do have a record that he's buried at Stratford. Is he in the churchyard? Is he in the monument, i.e. in the church? Or... I'll bring you back to this again. Um, remember, that's the door into the bone house, the charnel house. Actually, if you unblock that door right now, it goes straight into a buttress on the other side. I don't believe that door was originally exactly where we see it today. And in fact, I think the um, surround of it was an external part of it. Uh, it's possible that the monument was set above it. So I think, I'm speculating, I think what, what may be going on here is they're saying within this monument, i.e., in the charnel house, that's where you will find the remains of Shakespeare of Stratford. So within this monument, uh, Shakespeare, with whom quick nature died, i.e. He, he lost his life, he ran out of movement, whose name doth deck this tomb, deck to decorate this tomb, uh, far more than cost. Again, slightly rude thing to say, but uh, he's a merchant and, um, yeah, his name is much more valuable than any amount of wheeler dealering or cost. Um, see all that he hath writ. That C is spelt S-I-E-H, and there's been a lot of pondering about that. Um, it's been done for a reason, and I'm not going to show it to you this time. There's a way of de-encrypting this which creates a picture of a giant key, and the key reads, Vere lives in Shakespeare, whose name he is, and that he is at C backwards, and it, it appears in that. I think that's why it's been spelt in that silly way. But here we're just going to look at it as C. All that he hath writ, i.e. whatsoever he's written, um, leaves living art, i.e. what's left after he's died, but page to serve his wit. But page, just only a single page to show for his acumen. Well, I've just shown you what that's about. Uh, it's this, W. Shakespeare, his name is on the title page of plays. That's the only way in which living art um, has anything to do with him. It's his name, but page, just a single page to serve his wit. So that's the commemoration of uh, William of Stratford. And yes, it confirms that he's an actor, that he's a wool dealer, and also it confirms Ben Jonson uh, suggesting that he is a play broker who puts his name on the title page of things. So let's quickly go over the commemoration as we as we read it for William Shakespeare, the great um, author who we now know um, is buried in Westminster Abbey. So we've done all this bit, we've done the Latin, stay passenger, why goes there by so fast? Uh, read in this monument, figure out in this monument, if thou can, uh, canst whom envious death with Shakespeare have placed, we've done all that. Um, quick nature died, whose name, well this is interesting, Shakespeare is, is very often equated to nature, or the great imitator of nature, the equal of nature, so here he's actually being called quick nature, living nature died, whose name doth deck this tomb, Shakespeare is the name that decorates it, far more than cost, I, it's invaluable, far more than any amount of, uh, far more worth than any amount of money is this name. Um, See here, now we've gone through the spelling, but I think we can now read this as Sith since. Since all that he hath writ leaves living art but page to serve his wit. And here we've got a pun. Um, on the right, we looked at William of Shakespeare, but page meaning just a single page. His name was on a single page. And here, of course, page also means a servant. So everything, all of living art is but page, but a, but a mere servant to serve his wit, i.e. a footnote to everything wonderful that he's, that he's produced. So I hope you understand now how this works as both a monument to William uh, 
Shakespeare of Stratford, the, the merchant, and to William Shakespeare, the great writer, and how it distinguishes very cleverly between the two. So if you're getting interested, if you're already very interested in that Shakespeare authorship question, and people say to you, oh yeah, but um, you know, there's the monument in, in Stratford, and that says that, that he, he wrote things. Um, you answer to them, yes, there is a monument to to William of Stratford, and it says that all he did was contribute his name to the title page. And yes, there is a monument to Shakespeare, the great writer, uh, in Stratford-upon-Avon, and it's basically telling you that he's not buried in Stratford-upon-Avon, he's buried in Westminster Abbey. And that's how it works. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'm sorry it's a little bit uh, fast-paced, but I hope you've got the gist of it. And if you like this and if you like other ones, please subscribe and pass it around amongst your friends. Thank you very much.